Hi, HCF viewers. Uh, this is a presentation on a collection on edged weapons of the 20th century that were made, uh, issued, and sometimes we're also going to get into ones that people purchased on their own. And we're going to see the development. Uh, prior to World War I, individual knives could be purchased by a soldier or get one, bring one from home or whatever. What we're going to start seeing is the development of either contracted knives made for the government or the government making it themselves at the Springfield Armory. So we'll start, okay, now, in the early 1900s, the United States was involved in the Philippines, okay, which it had purchased from Spain. Now, of course, it had purchased it from Spain because Spain had lost control of it and was perfectly glad to get some money for something they no longer really had. And of course, the Filipinos were not exactly glad to see somebody else arrive and say, hi, I'm your new landlord when we just got rid of the old one. And one of the weapons that was, one of the tools I should say in the Philippines was a small machete type thing called a bolo. And when I took basic training in 1969, if you failed to qualify, they used to refer to it as you boloed. And they never explained what that meant. It took many years later to find out that during the Philippine insurrection or the Philippine American War, depending on which way you want to call it, uh, the rebels, if you were not a good shot, you were a bolo man. If you got a gun and you couldn't shoot it right, they took it away from you and gave you a bolo. So bolo meant not qualified to use a gun. And that's how that entered American military language. So we'll start over here with an issue bolo. Here's the information on it. You can see it even has a serial number. And it has US on it. Let me flip it over. And you can see it was made in the Springfield Armory. And this was a quality tool. And it was not designed to be used as a weapon. It was designed to clear brush. We're going to run into this. A lot of times these are made as tools but end up being weapons. All right? Now, in 1912, they started producing a smaller version of the bolo. And this one here, as you can see, it's a blued finish. It has a serial number. It was made in 1912. All right, and if you look, you'll see, okay, it has a green scabbard. The United States in early 1910 or so went to green, but the problem was the green dye came from Germany, and in 1914, they couldn't get their hands on the green dye, so they had to go back to khaki, which was basically, I guess, undyed cloth or the color they could get, and we see another bolo that was made in the Springfield Armory. Now, when World War I started, they wanted more bolos because they were considered entrenching tools. Theoretically, if you were in the U.S. Army and you had four or five guys, one guy would get a shovel, one guy would get a bolo, one guy would get a pickmatic, and one guy would get an ax. After a while, that didn't really work out. Everybody got shovels. But these were considered the tools, along with the pickmatic, the hand ax. Now, they needed mil a million bolos, and Springfield Armory just was not able to do it. So they went out to civilian contractors who turned around and told the Army, you guys are crazy. You're used to making guns. You're used to making things with such fine quality tolerances. You don't need that. We can make you bolos at half the price that you're making, that you're charging now, because you, you got, you're putting too much effort into making a machete, a small machete. So... We've got what we call the 1917. Well, this one here is a Springfield Armory, I believe. Is it? I have a tag there. All right. Yeah, made it Springfield. But this was, again, you know, a quality tool. So now what we start seeing is the commercial ones, like Plum. And these were parkerized. They weren't nicely made. They didn't have a little spring catch here like these have to lock into the scabbard. All right. And they were half the price. And then they looked at it and said, we can make them even cheaper. And by doing it, by changing how you put the, the uh, cross guard in, we'll just make it what they call commercial tang or CT. And this is commercial tang. And it was just a lot, it was cheaper and less involved to put a cross guard in. All right. So you got the regular ones and you got the CT. People think, think it stands for Connecticut. No, it doesn't. It means commercial tang. And again, 
that was the idea was that your bolo would be able to be. I wonder if I got the information here. Oh, yeah, look at this. Here. Oh, let's. Here. Let's add that to the presentation. And that's from Cole's book on U.S. on U.S. knives and bayonets and edged weapons. And you can see the difference as it developed. Okay, when the United States went to war, there was a need for what are called trench knives. And somebody gave him a suggestion that the requirement had to be, here it is, that they had to be able to be, penetrate a German winter uniform. Okay, so they came out, and there was two companies that got the contract, okay, and L, F, and C, Landers, Ferry, and Clark, and that's this one here, uh, and you can see it's, basically, it's a spike, and you'll notice the diamonds, that was the Landers, Ferry, and Clark version, they had these diamonds, it's early ones had an extra diamond up here someplace, but basically, they had these diamonds, so you could punch somebody really hard, and not let them get a good grip on you or not. Now, another company that made them was American Cutlery. And their design, you can see, they folded over the sides and got ridges, all right? So it's two different designs. It's the Landers Ferry and Clark, all right? Now, the problem with this is all you could do is stab with it. You couldn't do anything else with it. And you could not wear it on your on the left side for a left-handed person because of the way the scabbard was designed. All right, you cannot reverse this and put it in here. It just it's not going to work. Okay, so it's a poor design. And what happened to these? Well, after the war, the government decided what a piece of crap this is, and they went and unloaded all of them. They got rid of them right after the war, and they went to a lot of hardware stores where they were sold as ice picks, or they were given away as door prizes. That's how cheaply they were considered. Now, you're gonna see pictures of guys with them in the Second World War. That's people who re remember they had this crazy ice pick device that was sitting somewhere in the garage or the attic, and maybe they would mail it to uh, a member of the family who was serving, but the uh, by 1920, the government had gotten rid of them. They were a mistake. <clears throat> the next step was the trench knife Mark I, and that had a much longer life. The early, now if you're a real purist, the one you want is this one right here, Au Lyon. These were made in France and were issued to American soldiers, the Au Lyon, okay? Notice the bright blade, the marking, and you know, it's brass knuckles, and it even had a thing called skull crusher that if you could punch somebody on the top of their skull with this. All right. Now, in the United States, they contracted with a bunch of companies to make them, and one of them was Landers Ferry and Clark, and that's this one right here. And you can see it even on the handle, it's got L, F, and C. But a lot of those were made but never got sent overseas because the war was over. So they had lots of them, but they're going to be used, they're going to be recycled for the next war. And another company that was given a contract is Disson and Sons. And this is a Disson and Sons. You can make it out on the handle. All right. Now, when the Second World War rolls along and they need a combat knife, well, what does the government have? Well, the federal government's got a lot of these still in stock. Remember, these they got rid of. They, they, they junk. They're gone. And they had to issue them out to people. And a lot of times they were given to paratroopers, um, first, you know, um, command, commando type units, I should say. Anybody that was special, they were not gonna be general issue. And paratroopers in particular would carve away a lot of metal so it would fit closer to their, to their body. Um, they're not manufacturing anymore. They're just using up the ones they already have in stock. They decided it was just too much trouble to make this with all the brass it takes and so forth. So they became a desirable item and a, and a status symbol. If you had a trench knife like this, you obviously were special. Now, during the war, they had run into the British and their commando knives. This one here is a post-war commando knife, but it's a famous Fairbairn size Sykes knife. 
And again, some special units would get them, OSS and so forth. And um, again, this is a, a pretty common item as a combat knife. Now the Marine Corps wanted a knife and the Navy got them one. And it's the thing we now refer to as the K-Bar. The K-Bar was actually a brand name of one of the companies that made it, okay? It's a big buoy type knife, okay? And that was popular with, with the Marines. All right, the Army needed a combat knife and they developed what became known as the M3. And the M3 was to be issued to anybody that did not have a bayonet, like a guy armed with an M1 carbine or a Thompson submachine gun, all right? Now, you will find them, let's see if I got both types here. Okay, the M3, this is just a regular M3. The earlier ones were sometimes marked on the blade. And unfortunately, I thought I had one here that's marked on the blade, my mistake, okay. And it came in what's called the M8 scabbard. And the M8 scabbard, all right, has a loop in the back to put on your belt. And again, it was the M3 combat knife. The ones that are stamped on the blade are very nice, but that weakened the blade, so that's the stop. After a while, somebody said, well, why can't we make it a bayonet for the M1 carbine? So what they did is they kept the M3 style in the blade and they produced the bayonet for the M1 carbine. And the army manuals on, com on combatives in the early 60s would show this as a combat knife. They would show you how to fight with a knife. They would show you to fighting with a carbine thing. Now, that caused a change in the scabbard. Uh, they had to put hooks on it so you could fit it on your belt. And they would often put a metal reinforcing uh, tip. And that became the M8A1 scabbard which became the standard scabbard for a lot of bayonets. All right, there's the M5 bayonet for the M1, the M6 for the, uh, for the M14. I mean, I might, wait, let me go take that back. M5 for the Springfield, M, wait, M5 for the M1, M6 for the M14, M7 for the M6, M16. Now, that bayonet style continued for many, many years. Now, along the way, we ran into the Soviet bayonets. And this one here is a Polish one. And it's got an insulated uh, handle and it's got a wire cutter built in. Now it's gonna fight me to open it, all right? But anyway, we looked at it. People thought that was a great design. So we came out with the M9 bayonet, which is really impressive. It's got a thick blade. It's got a nice fiberglass handle. This is an M9. There is a sharpening stone in the back. Up behind the scabbard there, you got a sharpening stone. And this little pocket here, I'm trying to remember what was supposed to be stored in the pocket. There's a little pocket here for something or another, probably another sharpening stone or something. Let me see what I got in there. But this was gonna be a bayonet for the Yeah, it's another sharpening stone, okay. But um, again, this was, that would be the standard bayonet for the M16, A2, A3. It's a good quality blade. You can see Probus M9. So what we're really doing is we're going away from a bayonet used as a knife to a knife that can be used as a bayonet. And it too has the capability like the Soviet models for cutting wire, okay? Now, is it insulated like the uh, like um, the Russian one? I don't really know, okay? Now, the Marine Corps, being the Marine Corps, wanted their own knife. Now, remember, they had the K-Bar, but they wanted something that could also be used as a bayonet. So you get what's called the OKC. And it's proprietary to the Marine Corps. It's got the Marine Corps emblem and symbols. All right, and you can see it's got some serrations on it. It's a, it's an impressive knife. That's also a bayonet that you can put on your M4 if you need a bayonet. Now, during the war, uh, you also developed. I'm going to show you an item that was not designed to be a weapon, but ended up as the machete. 
Now, this is a very early machete. You can see it's the markings on it, Collins Company, all right? And the scabbard, let I me mean, look on the back, you can see here it's a government issue scabbard. It's got the hooks. And there is a picture of paratroopers in Europe standing next to a captured Nazi flag, and they're there with the weapons, and one guy standing there with his machete. Again, it was not designed to be used as a combat weapon, but in hand-to-hand -hand combat training, you sometimes found that uh, certain instructors, this, this is a film dealing with the ranger school in Hawaii in 1943, and they show you guys practicing with machetes, all right? Now, in the 1980s, a, a knife culture seemed to really develop at Fort Bragg. I was there at the time. And a lot of people were buying knives at the PX because you got a good price and they were good knives, okay? So let me look at, show you some of them. Okay, one of them was the Air Force Survival Knife, which is well known, okay? And this one, okay, you could tie it to a, to a stick you could pound with it, but it had a leather handle. And some of them had a little pocket and they would have a sharpening stone. And a family member of ours went to the Air Force Academy and he was issued one for their survival course. Uh, next to it here is a early Gerber. Uh, Gerber were very popular knives, a Mark II. And this is the very early ones with the, what they call cat tongue grip. But for a while there, you know, and black leather scabbard, Gerber. Very popular at Fort Bragg where Gerber combat, well, here's the funny thing. They used to be sold as combat knives and somebody made a real big stink to the PX that they're selling these lethal weapons. So they turned around and started calling them survival knives. But they were a very popular item along with this, particularly for the paratroopers was the Mark I. Because the Mark I was basically a boot knife, you can see here. It's got a clip. And a lot of paratroopers, when I was there, uh, they were big on, on getting uh, the Mark II as a, you know, per private purchase. And again, you could buy them in the PX at a good price, or you could go into town and pay more, plus the sales tax. But uh, they were, again, popular items. Uh, again, when I worked with the Special Forces at Bragg, the, the big joke they used to have is, how can you tell a real Special Forces guy? Well, he's got four items, a Green Beret, a Rolex watch, a Randall knife, and divorce papers, okay? Now, the Randalls were handmade, expensive quality knives, and a lot of guys were willing to do it, but if you wanted to be on a budget, you bought a good Gerber, and it wasn't much. Now, I'm gonna bring you some literature here if you're into knives, okay. Uh, Cold Steel was a famous book written by a guy named Styers from the Marine Corps, Techniques of Close Combat, and it was written after World War II. It's been reprinted many times, but it's, it's a good book on bayonet fighting, knife fighting, all right? Marine Corps put a lot more effort into it than the other branches. Um, this is the Army Field Manual called Combatives. And this one here, the yeah, FM-21-150. And for knife fighting, they tended to show the M1 carbine bayonet and stuff like that. And they had a lot of moves, but uh, that's their manual. Uh, you could buy books like this. This is Army Air Force Exchange System, the Everybody Knife Bible, somebody's commercial, Military Knife Fighting by this guy Robert Spear. And he specialized in using the bayonet or the K-bar. Uh, combat Use of Double-Edged Fighting Knives by Rex Applegate, who, of course, is one of the great mentors of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, particularly from World War II. He had been uh, in the OSS and, and training agents. Now, the guidebook for Marines has a good section on fighting with the OKC, the Marine Corps knife that I mentioned before, but it has a, a whole section devoted to, you know, how to use this as an effective weapon. And a guy who's not well known, hopefully you will be well known, thanks to HCF again, is Mikey Canis. Uh, knife fighting, knife throwing for combat. A fantastic book on that. And you can see he uses a Gerber, which again, was readily available. Randall knives were very expensive. 
But your Gerbers, they, you know, pick them up at the PX or buy them mail order. So we have here, like I said, a collection of uh, combat cutlery for the 20th century. And really appreciate comments from people, any mistakes I made, or things that you want to add to the knowledge of people.